Okay, Mr. Ben Stoner, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. How are you, Alex? Good, good. So um, I wanted to get you on the show just to kind of introduce you to, to my audience specifically because uh, a lot of people don't know really how how you got to where you are, including myself. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, when I met <laughs> you at Bowling Green for the first time, this guy has a black car and a really nice pie cut turbo kit looking really good. You know, the cold side looked really good. I'm like, who the heck is this guy? And then uh, the car ran pretty well. And then five years later, you're, you and your company is responsible for some of the fastest, if not the fastest, GT350s on the planet. Um, some of the nicest fabrication, just in terms of parts and kits and everything based on what you show. Um, let me just ask you from the beginning, like what got you into cars? Like initially, what got you into cars? Oh man, like going back that far, uh, yeah. you know, Hot Wheels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, seriously though, like I remember, you know, buying every Hot Wheel I could find as a kid. Um, you know, they had the uh, Lamborghinis and stuff that changed color when you ran them through water. I don't know how old you are if you remember those or not, but how old? Uh, <laughs> how old are you? I'm 44. <laughs> okay, well, I just turned 42, so we're we're same age. Gotcha. Similar. Yeah. Gotcha. You don't remember those? Uh, well, okay. Um, I don't know if you know my history. Oh, okay. I was poor, man. I was poor, poor. So we had whatever I could find or whatever. We, you know, we had like the, yeah. the green army men, but once in a while you'd come across a hot wheel and you're like, whoa. And it was like the, the biggest piece of junk you could find, but you'd like kept it forever. I'm not saying, yeah. you know, you were rich because you had the color changing Lambo, but <laughs> you had access to that. <laughs> I, I definitely, I definitely did not. So I'm saying like, did your dad get you into cars? Is that something that was like a passion of yours? Yeah, I mean, he he always liked to have a nice cars. Um, you know, he'd take care of his cars. We'd wash them, stuff like that. But he wasn't what I consider a gearhead. Um, you know, I didn't really get hard into cars until I got my driver's license and started hanging out with some friends at school. We, I really got my start in like mini trucks. You know, we had like lowered S10 stuff like that, cruising around with stereos and wheels and that kind of thing. You know, not really any performance oriented stuff until. I was probably 17 and a friend of mine had a, a front wheel drive Eclipse uh, GST. A friend named Terry of mine had that and uh, it took me for riding that as the first turbo car I'd ever been in. And as soon as I felt the turbo, I was like, "That I've got to get into this. This is awesome. <laughs> so so from then on out, I, I bought a 92 Eagle Talon all-wheel drive car, started modifying that, and then had numerous turbo cars since then. So that, that's really what got me into it. So DSM, you were into DSMs uh, yeah. to begin your car addiction, if you want to put it that way. What merged or at what point did you start looking at Mustangs because I, I doubt you were looking at three valves and four valves and going, man, I got to get into that. You somehow yeah. ended up coyote stuff. Um, from what I can tell right away, like when did you start merging from DSM Evos eclipses into um, the Mustang stuff? So, well, to rewind just a little bit before I got my license, uh, I wanted nothing more than to have a Fox body a or a five liter Fox body car. That was what I wanted my first car to be. Um, my dad said, no way, it's too fast, you can't have that. Uh, shut that down right away. So, you know, then I was easily able to convince him that a four-cylinder car can't be fast. So, you know, right, the, the right. turbo car is, this is just a four-cylinder, Dad, you know, it's fine. Uh, so I was able to get into that. So th then the DSM and Evo and all that stuff, that lasted for a long time. Uh, I met a lot of great friends along the way. That's where I met uh, my business business partner, best friend, Jeremy, uh, who you're familiar with, so doing all the driving out there and awesome welding and fabricating. Uh, he was a DSM guy as well, Turbo Dodge guy before that, um, yeah. which, which is how we met our other uh, partner, John, is through uh, Turbo Dodge stuff originally. Um, is he the beard, bearded guy? Yeah, the the bearded big beard, yeah, the big bearded guy. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we started our shop under that umbrella that we were going to work on uh, Evos, turbo kits, uh, build intercooler kits, stuff like that. Um, and we did that for years, um, you know, along the way. Uh, I ended up getting, when the Coyote came out, um, I have been racing DSMs for a long time. We broke something every time we floored it pretty much because there's just not made to do that kind of stuff. You know, these cars are making 900 horsepower on a four banger. Um, you know, we're making two, 300 horsepower, a hole in the, for the motor and, and uh, they're just not made for it. They break everything, drivetrain, motor, you know, whatever you could break, we'd break it and you get tired of it. And the Coyote came out. And in our eyes, it was kind of like, hey, this is kind of like two four cylinders put together. The cylinder heads work well, they flow well. Uh, these things are just craving boost. We got to get one. So uh, at the time, I think I had a 335i BMW as a daily driver. And I sold that and bought the what was what became the Jam Maker. Um, right. And Jeremy and I drove down to Bowling Green during, I think it was LS Fest was going on in Bowling Green at the time. Uh, okay. Picked up 
picked up the Mustang from the dealership, drove it straight to LS Fest, and went and hung out there with some friends. Uh, drove it back, and then we actually ordered turbos for it uh, the next week. Um, we didn't end up turboing it, though. We ended up doing a VMP supercharger on it for the first year. Uh, but that's that's what got us into the Coyote world. Once we started messing with that car, it was, you know, these cars are great. They don't break. You can have 700 horsepower street car that's a blast to drive and doesn't really have any problems. You know, you can floor it all the time and enjoy it. So what, so because I don't, I didn't see you guys really hit the S197 chassis like super hardcore. Uh, once S550 came out, is that when you guys kind of started looking at that and going, okay, that car has a lot of potential. And if so, like why wasn't the S197 more prevalent in the fat house umbrella? Um, and, and what was the determining factor to really go hardcore uh, after the S550 stuff? So as any uh, starting business or especially young automotive business goes, I think, you know, we were stuck in that say yes to everything, you know, do anything you can to pay the bills and make money and, you know, survive as a, as a young business. So we were working on Mustangs, Evos, Challengers, Camaros, you know, it, you name it, we were working on it. Uh, wow, okay. it, it took us a little while to pull back far enough from that and say, look, we need to specialize. We've got to narrow our scope, uh, you know, be better at one thing instead of trying to be good at all these other things. So it took us, you know, until the S550 came out for us to uh, get into that stride and start really working on just Mustangs. Um, so we, we turboed a Mustang uh, for a customer, then S550 built the first turbo kit there, uh, did a couple more, did our first GT350. And once we did our first GT350 for uh, one of our really good customers named Tony, uh, he was the first one we did, uh, for the 350. And then as soon as we heard that with, with turbos on it, we're like, this, this is a, this is like supercar stuff. This car sounds amazing. It revs really hard. Um, you know, the, the Shelby guys were a little bit different breed of customer uh, than we were used to dealing <laughs> with. <laughs> so we, we kind of just, you know, took that market and just, and we saw where we could go with it. Interesting. So you, you, you worked on other platforms, Dodge, Chevy, um, Ford, um, when you were in the thick of it, meaning like doing cold airs, exhaust, whatever you needed to do to pay the bills <clears throat> was for lack of a better word, one customer base, uh, not as desirable to work with than others. Like our Dodge guys tend to be uh, more hardcore or they, do they tend to do big engine builds? Do they just want to do cold airs and look pretty? Cause there's a lot of places or a lot. Okay. A lot of uh, people with certain platforms wanted to look good as opposed to perform in terms of track stuff. Did you find one platform leaned towards a certain performance variant than, than just racing stuff? Um, I, I don't know that, I don't know that we worked in them that deep to really, you know, classify them that hard. Um, I think every, every genre of cars has their group of people that just wants to flex and look cool and sound cool and put loud exhaust. I don't care how much power it makes. You know, we had customers um, that we put cams in like LS trucks and they would, uh, they didn't care that the truck would die at the stoplight. They wanted the idle to be as low as possible. I want the biggest stage cam I can get. And I want the idle at 300 RPMs. If it dies, I don't care. I just want it to, you know, shake the ground as much as possible. Um, but, and then that, a lot of that is, you know, you, you get so many customers that want something different. Every customer wants to do something completely different than the next one. So that made it hard to uh, really narrow down. Uh, you know, your processes. And that's a lot of where our package stuff came from was being able to, you know, say, this is how we're going to do it. This is what your options are and kind of go from there and be able to actually make it a, a good profitable business. Right. That's the interesting um, thing that you have somehow, which to me is, I'm going to be honest, it's mind blowing. You have somehow cornered the high end Mustang market. And when I started seeing what you guys were doing that nobody else was doing, meaning, full builds with aftermarket um, computers, MoTeC, uh, you know, adjust, you know, cam tune on the fly, GT350 is making 13, 14, 100 horsepower, you know, stick, stick GT350s, what, three, four years ago, running 860s, you know, which, you yeah. know, for a non, for a non slipper style clutch is stupid. It's like amazing. So how did that come about in terms of, did it just kind of fall on your lap once you did two or three GT350s and you said, okay, I got to concentrate on these or did you do one for one, a good customer, word of mouth just spread and all of a sudden everyone wants you, wants a $1,400, $900, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it was a, it was a big process of trying to figure out what we wanted to do um, as a shop. So we, you know, doing all those different kind of packages, different, or not packages, but different cars, different platforms, working everything, you know, you're just beating your head against the wall every day. Um, it's not fun. 
it's hard to please customers. It's hard to give them what they want. It's hard to give them anything at a good price um, and give them any kind of value. So we really had a lot of sit down talks say with each other, what do we need to do to make ourselves happy in what we're doing and make our customers happy and do cool shit. Um, and we had enough conversations. We were like, look, we need to you know, look at what shops are really successful out there. You know, underground racing, AMS, you know, T1, some of the bigger tier shops, they all focus on packages. So we, we really sat down and said, okay, what can we do? What, what cars can we work on? What kind of packages can we offer? How can we be different? How can we set ourselves aside and how can we, um, you know, provide the level of quality that we want to and be able to charge enough for it to make it worth doing this every day. Um, and the packages is kind of, we're born from that. Um, you know, we scale everything up and we're, you know, what, what does it take to do an 800 horsepower package? Well, what do you, what do you need for a thousand horsepower package? Put all that stuff together as a standard package and then start writing documentation on it. Um, you know, we have a, a full owner's manual that comes with the cars uh, as far as, you know, how to operate the car, um, how all the features work, all the mods that are on the car, maintenance, all that kind of stuff. And we just wanted to make it a complete, you know, A to B package that, you know, or A to Z package that a customer can pick up done just like they would from a dealership. Um, and then once we started pushing that out there, it just was received really, really well. Yeah, like everyone saw it. And um, whether they want to ad admit to it or not, <clears throat> they probably went, shit, why didn't I think of that? Like, why didn't I think of building packages <laughs> for, for the high-end Mustang market? Because uh, a lot of people didn't realize there is a high-end Mustang market. People go, well, it's a Mustang. Who's going to mess with that? Then all of a sudden, cars are rolling out of Fat House with 1,300 horse, Motec, Ghost Cam on the fly. By the way, I want to talk about what is the biggest <laughs> selling point with your packages <clears throat> and uh, like what sells your packages. But before I get to that, let's talk about the fabrication and the things, if you don't mind. Um, I know you sure. you have a Fat House Fab and Fat House Performance. At, at what point did that kind of split? Because I thought it was always Fat House Fab, but then I saw Performance come up. Is that was that a uh, a conscious effort to split both so that you can have basically separation between uh, you know fabrication and parts and labor and uh, packages? Yeah. So the Fat House Performance focuses <laughs> on the completed builds packages uh, that are done, and then Fat House Fab. Uh, does all the building of the parts and then sells parts as well. So you can buy parts from Fat House Fab uh, for your own car. Um, you know, you can't buy parts from Fat House Performance, like Fat House Performance stuff. They, you know, it's a completed package on the car. Uh, we just wanted to kind of separate those. I, they're still under the same umbrella, same people, same building. Uh, we just wanted to do kind of focus the branding a little bit different with the two companies. Very good. So in terms of the actual fabrication of the turbo kits, like, who is the brainchild behind that? I know you got, because I'm not really sure who, you seem to have multiple fabricators and pe really smart people because look, the stuff, when you look at it, you just know it's badass shit. It's not like run of the mill stuff. You guys like take the engine out of the car, put it up on this bench and start building it there. So like in terms of the layout of the turbo kit, how you guys wanted everything done, like who was the brainchild or was it a collective effort to, to see how you guys wanted everything to look in the car? Because aesthetically, it's super pleasing to be under a GT350 that you guys built. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, you know, everything at the shop is a group effort. Um, every Everything we do takes multiple people. No one person is responsible for everything. Um, but as far as the fabrication goes, like Jeremy is behind all that. Uh, he's, the, he's the guy that, you know, works late at night building stuff just to build it, to see what he can do. And, and you know, pushing himself, pushing the envelope to do cool new stuff, even though everybody else tells him he's crazy. Um, so, so that most of the ideas come from him for sure. Okay. Excellent. And then in terms of turbo selection, do you guys, um, lean towards the per the people you use for a certain reason? You just have a good relationship with them. Like, do you guys still use the same turbo compressor that the turbo itself from a, a, a specific company or do you guys branch? Let's say if the customer wanted precisions or if you wanted Garrett's or if you wanted something, I know that changes some of the stuff you guys like to do in terms of how it fits or do you like what you have? based on the aesthetic design and, and you know the way it lays into your, your your turbo kit yeah so we've been through a lot of different vendors a lot of different manufacturers through this whole process and finding stuff that is meets our standards quality wise and reliability wise um so we've had we've used just about all the major manufacturers of turbos and we've settled on the zona brand uh for multiple different reasons the quality of their products are above all from what we've seen that reliability really? is there. Oh yeah, they're they're. I mean, they're the turbos. They use all. It's a. Do you know who Zona is? Are you familiar with them very yes, much? I, I, I was yeah. on a plane with them. It was crazy. I taught oh, you. Nice. Just, with Robert. <laughs> yeah, the the, beard, the bearded fellow. Yeah, oh, yeah. Big hippie. He's a hippie. <laughs> a hippie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he just talked my ear off, and I just listened. 
I just, I just, oh, he's listen. super smart. Yeah. He's super smart. When, when, someone, when someone starts talking in that capacity, I just shut my mouth and listen. So, so tell me about like what they're just like, why do you pick them over say precision Garrett and anyone else? <clears throat> so the, I mean, we, we had a ton of reliability issues with precision. I think a lot of people did. I don't know where they're at these days with their stuff, but um, we, we had trouble with them uh, early on. Uh, you know, Garrett makes great stuff, but they don't really make the specs that we want. And it's not, they're not the type of company you can easily get a custom spec turbo from. Uh, we've known Robert and Force Performance, who is the uh, half of Zona. The other half is Tile. Um, we've known that known them from the DSM days way back in the day. So we've always known they've been around. He started pushing the Zona brand uh, as we were starting to build these packages. And we kind of talked a little bit here and there about doing some custom spec turbos. Um, you know, we like the turbos to be small and compact to fit tightly so everything's tucked up inside the, the car uh, and to be able to make the power we want to make and do that took a custom turbo. Um, you know, so, and we also spoke with Robert about our, uh, reliability issues that we've been having, uh, smoking issues, turbos going out, things like that, that we absolutely couldn't have. Uh, and he assured us that, you know, if he had any issues like that, he would take care of it and that it wouldn't be a problem. Um, you know, so we started using his turbos and, and we haven't looked back since and we haven't had any issues whatsoever. Um, and he's continuing to develop new turbos for us to use. We have a new turbo that's about to come out in our packages that will, uh, still fit without any camera modifications and support about 16, 1700 horsepower. So, um, Oof. that's a really cool. Wow. We're excited to test that. Yeah. Because about the last thing a GT 350 owner wants after dropping six figures plus is when he decels after a pull to have a big puff of blue smoke behind the car and go, right. that's normal because of the drain, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, know, you don't want to have to explain. He goes, no, my, my the car that I spent my retirement on should not be smoking on diesel. If an R8 doesn't smoke on diesel and a Lambo doesn't smoke on exactly. diesel, so I, so I understand the whole smoking issue. Which as a I'm not a turbo guy, but uh, I, I understand many things based on what people tell me and what the lungs do. And uh, I'm a blower guy, so I'm like oh, I don't have that issue. But then <laughs> um, when everyone says, see, you know, at the end of the track, you see a car just blow a bunch of smoke. They go, oh, "That's normal." I'm like, "What do you mean it's normal?" Like. <laughs> I don't think it's normal, but apparently a lot of people just dismiss it as, you know, part of the the characteristics <laughs> of that yeah. certain turbo brand or whatever. So that blows my mind. <clears throat> so let me ask you then. So when you start building these cars and things are starting to really look really good because you have uh, how many employees would you say are hands on with the vehicles? I know you're like, I don't I don't really know your position in the company. I don't know if you're president, you're the, uh, you're probably everything, uh, in terms of the clerical side of things, <laughs> yeah. but, um, like the guys were actually working on the vehicles, just a couple of guys, isn't it? Yeah, we've got, so hands on with the vehicles. I think we have seven. Oh, geez. I thought you had like three. Why did I think? Yeah. <laughs> did I think okay. Wonderful. Okay. So you have yeah. about seven guys. And at what point do you start going, okay, we, we need to like hire people because I'm sure you didn't start with seven. Like, okay, there's like four GT three fifties in the lot and we got to get on it. Like at what year did that start kind of like ramping up to where you started saying, Hey, this could be viable. This could be an actual business model that we can run with. Yeah. I mean, th things have been getting exciting since 2017, 2018 really started getting hot and heavy with stuff. Um, and we've went through, honestly went through a lot of, a lot of employees. We've, it took us quite a few hires and fires to get to the team that we have now. Um, and honestly, I, if we had the room for two more techs, I'd hire two more techs today. Um, wow. We're just at, we're out of space. I don't have anywhere to put them right now, um, which we're working on a solution for that. But market right now is nuts, so that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so I mean, we, we, it's been you know for in years in the making of building this team, and it and it's a really good team that we have right now. And and I couldn't be more proud of the guys that we've got in the shop. Yeah, you guys seem like a good bunch because every single time I meet up with you guys, you guys are very personable, super easy to talk to. And I've always thought like that must be a, a tight core group of guys because you don't get successful or you don't get to where you guys are if you have like a lot of turnover, like a, a ton of turnover eventually becomes ridiculous. Out of all the cars you've built, which one do you feel was the one that kind of like either put you over the hump or your most favorite? build i'm sure the white one with the blue stripes has been on your channel in different or uh, different forms it's been a turbo 400 car it's been a stick car it's been a many things so um which which car that you built would, would you go yeah that's 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 my bitch right there that's the one that you know i look at it and i go yeah that's bring that sucker in i want to see it again yeah that so so that's a good customer named tom and his car has been probably the the most utilized video for any kind of promotion racing uh, you know, he, he's always willing to push the envelope, try something new. 
uh, you know, he was the first car we did Motec on, uh, that Motec video was his car. He's the first car we ran eights in as a stick. And then we put the turbo four, turbo 400 in, um, and it's been, shit, I think seven fifties now. Um, you know, that, that car has definitely been the, you know, the test bed for a lot of new things along the way and, and being able to push the envelope on stuff. So I'd say that's probably our mo most popular prominent car that we have. And do you personally have a car that you maybe delivered to a customer and you would say, if I was to build it a certain way, it'd be like that. Like let's say an eight hundred R or eleven hundred R, you you get in and you're like this, oh, like a wide body three fifty R or something silly like that. You're like that's the car I would build for myself. Yeah, so we so we actually do we own the very first uh, Shelby wide body GT three fifty. So we bought I that from it. Shelby. Yeah, it's we oh, wow. we've, it's on a list of videos, a long list of videos to catch up on. Um, but we bought the very first car they ever did. It's a pre production seal number one car, uh, wide body from Shelby. And then we did our 1200R package on it. So it's built motor, MoTeC, T56 Magnum swap, wide body, carbon fiber stuff all over it. Um, it it's That car is my favorite car to drive ever. I, I love driving that car. It's got a, I think it's a three, it's a 335 rear tire in it and a Toy Rush Triple Eight. So it's like a steamroller. It, and, it, and it literally, no, no kidding, with MoTeC and everything, I mean, you can't, it's hard to get that car out of control. Like if you, as long as you have traction control and like optimal settings and stuff, like it just goes. And it is just a blast to drive. So get me uh, caught up on the whole thought process of getting involved with MoTeC. And um, the person you use is Johnson Tuning, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Corbin. Yeah. Corbin, sorry. I say, how did you even think about, yeah, let's look at MoTeC and let's see uh, how that works. Is it because of your DSM experience that made you go, hey, let's try it on these Mustangs, see how it goes? Yeah, it, it was, I'm going to give cre Corbin credit for all that. Like, so we started working with Corbin and I don't remember the exact year. I probably should have looked it up, but probably like 2014 or 2015, uh, he started coming around the shop, tuning cars for us. He's a Subaru guy. Uh, so he knows how to tune delicate things, <laughs> you know, those <laughs> motors are glass. Um, but he, we watched, we watched Corbin grow. Like he, he was, you know, picking up Mustang stuff, learning new, new platforms left and right doing a great job with him. He wasn't uh, having any issues with it. If he, something he didn't understand, he would learn it, come back and do better. And he pitched the idea. He's like, Hey, I think we should do MoTeC on one of these. And we're like, we're like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Tell us more about it. You know? So we talked, talked it through. Uh, we got a package going. Um, he worked with the uh, VIT from MoTeC um, on mm -hmm. the firmware stuff for it. Uh, got the first one going, started playing around with it. We're like this, you know, this works really, really well. And you know, the features that it offered, um, we had a few key customers, uh, we pitched it to right off the bat. We we're like, yeah, man, let's do it. So we started doing those and doing the promotional videos. And, and then once we did that, everybody, everybody wanted it. What is the biggest selling point of your packages? Meaning if a customer doesn't know Fat House Fab and they look at your stuff, what do you think sells uh, customers on a GT350 full build? What do you think is the biggest selling point? The biggest single selling point? single selling point like one thing that they yeah. they always mention in every single you know when you're you're writing up their their slip and you're just like and he's like make sure this is you know this yeah. needs to happen <laughs> everybody wants ghost cam <laughs> honestly <laughs> it is the, the the sound of the the ghost cam the exhaust files opening up turbo spooling up and the car starting to go scam gets everybody every time like hands down yeah. especially if they come to the shop yeah, like, do you guys have a vehicle there that's always ready to ghost cam just to sell it? Like, hey, look, we're yeah, look at no, this. it's you usually yes, this. yeah, usually usually we have a, we try to have a running car around the shop all the time anyway because we if people stop by and they're serious like we we love to take them for a ride, cruise around, show them how well the cars drive. You know, they drive just like stock until you put your foot in it. Um, you know, it, they're just they're amazing cars the way they the way they drive, handle, put power down, um, and the way they sound. So if we can take a customer for a ride, you know, that's just the the best way to get folks on the job. Excellent. What is your favorite feature of the MoTeC? Like, um, uh, is it the traction control? Is it the uh, changing maps on the fly? Is it the flex fuel? What, what would you say? That's tough. Is your, right, because there's a lot. There's a yeah. list. And then, like, I've started looking at some of the tables because, you know, people are starting to play with that stuff. And I'm just like, oh, my God, there's so much stuff to to decompile like there is there is actual logic apparently where you can decel and have it be at negative eight degrees and it just makes this burbling popping sound and if you can literally shoot flames out the sucker and there's like tables set up for that and i'm like mm -hmm. okay so <laughs> what would be your um if you were to have to pick one or two just tell me you can you can rate them like hey this one is this one this one is my favorite feature of the motec unit on the gt350 uh, uh stuff 
Yeah, so it, it's tough to pick because, like you said, there is a lot of great features. Um, you know, the, the safety features, for one, are, are not – I wouldn't say they're a favorite because you just don't really know about them. But if from an, from an aspect of, like, what it offers to uh, keeping your car safe, keeping it from blowing the engine up, that kind of stuff is probably the most valuable feature that it has. Um, most people don't care about that. <laughs> they, you try to sell them <laughs> on it, and they're just, they're just like, well, you know, it's whatever. I'm not worried about that. Um, but for me, I would say probably the traction control combined with boost by gear. Uh, because that's the biggest problem with these cars. I mean, you can throw 1,000 horsepower, 1,200 horsepower at these cars, and they're that's great. You know, you put the biggest tire you can on them, and they still spin all over the place. Like, there's just not a lot you can do. Uh, boost by gear and traction control changes everything with these cars. I mean, you can really put a, a mediocre driver in one of these cars, set up the traction control for them, have them go out, floor it. They can enjoy it. They say, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I want to turn it up a little bit, and they can adjust the traction control uh, map on the fly. They can change the mode uh into uh sport track or drag mode and, and get more power um just with you know pushing a couple of buttons uh that's huge for customers because most most of these guys have never been in a car this fast you know they, they've never been in a car that uh you know puts a thousand horsepower to the rear tires especially rear wheel drive car and turning them loose on a car without trash control is dangerous i mean look, look what happened was it uh kevin hart or whatever his <laughs> the incident was yes the car. Oh my God. Yeah. thank you yeah, yeah he just went off into the weeds and and people got mad at me for mentioning that and i'm like it is irresponsible to put someone like that in a th people don't realize what an 800 horsepower car is like on the street you're like oh my god this thing is freaking fast and then you say oh i want 1100 and I, i'm sure you've had customers that have never had a car that has had made over an Ultima, you know, 400 horse. And then they go, mm -hmm. I want 1600 horse. And you're like, excuse me? Like, are you ever going to use that? And then you almost have to, do you ever have to like bring them back down to planet earth with their expectation? Or do you just say, yes, sir. And by the way, it's all adjustable on this knob and here's your manual and good luck. Yeah, no, we, we definitely uh, tell customers, you know, the truth, you know, let them know, you know, if you, we always ask customers, what's the fastest car you've ever drove, um, you know, try to get an idea of what they're used to, uh, you know, and then, and then try, the try to help them along the way. Like what's, what's been the funniest answer? What's been the funniest answer when they're like, "What's the best um, car you've ever driven?" It's like, "Oh, my mom's an Altima. Uh, it's an SE, though." <laughs> and you're like, you, oh. Usually, honestly, the the best answers we usually get are usually like, "What's the car I just dropped off?" You know, the the car that the car the stock car that I just dropped off to you that you're gonna double or Oof. triple the horsepower and is the fastest car I've ever had. You know, so then we we know at that point, okay, we're gonna have to you know show this person how to use the car, make sure they understand, make sure they respect it, that kind of stuff. So, and we always try to take people out in the car when we're, when we're done with it, if we have the opportunity to, and, you know, let them see what it's about. When the customer picks up the car, right? You've, you know, they paid their bill. You say, okay, here's your car. Um, and then they drive it for the first time. What are the, some of the things that people have said when they come back to the shop aside from holy shit and, you know, a bunch of other things, what has been like, I'm sure you've had some memorable impressions from customers that have shown up, picked up the car, gone, oh my God, like has anyone cried? Has anyone said, oh my God, this is exactly what I wanted? Like what has been the, mo the best reaction you've received from uh, delivering one of the vehicles that you build? Yeah, so there's a, there's a video on our YouTube channel from a guy that came down from Canada to pick up his car. And he's, just, he's like a big, like bearded, jolly Canadian guy. And we took him for a ride in his car, took him for a ride in the 1400R. Uh, and he is just giggling and laughing the whole time. Like, doesn't even really know what to say. He's just like, oh, shit, that's amazing. Just like laughing all the time. You have to watch the video because it's funny uh, just to hear okay. how happy he is about it. But, I mean, most of the time it's just, you know, this is crazy. It's the best thing I've ever had. I love the sound. Like, you know, people are just, you know, pumped to have the car back and just, you know, pumped to enjoy to drive it. You know, we get emails from customers all the time saying they took it to Cars and Coffee and crowds around the car. You know, everybody wanted to hear the car, see what it sounded like. And figure out, you know, who built the car and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's always cool to hear about that. Yeah. That's one of those things that must, must be like a bit, a bit of a feather in your cap. When you, when you see a GT350, you go to GT350. Then you say, oh, it's a fat house, GT350. So people go, oh, that's like saying, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what to compare it to because there isn't really a comparison in our world. Let's say like, I don't know who, Lingenfelter or like, you know, who, who's in the Camaro world or in the, in the, in the Chevy world, that's an aftermarket builder like you that people would go oh it's a you know, like a lingenfeld or corvette you can say you know not roush mustang because to me that they have a, a tight affiliation with ford but when you see a fat house fat 350 you kind of pay attention and you're like oh okay that's like a thing and um is that was that the goal or it just kind of became that way along the way as you guys are building cars yeah no i mean that's definitely the goal i mean we wanted to uh build the brand build the brand build the name like we really want to uh, you know, be known as uh, a Lingenfelter, uh, uh, Avengers Racing is uh, another 
you know, GM shop that does a lot of, a lot of nice builds. Um, you know, we, we want to build that brand that the brand is where it's at. I mean, people trust your brand. Like if we build a brand build a name for ourselves, build a reputation and, you know, people trust that, you know, the car they're getting from us is going to be a solid car. It's going to hold its value. It's going to be worth money uh, down the road. They're more apt to, to spend the money to build it with you in the first place. So if we can, you know, build that name up over the years and it's not going to, it's not an easy process, you know, it's something that you're going to get with time, you know, it's going to take 10, 20, 30 years to build that name, but we're committed to the, you know, the process and, and being around for a long, long time. Excellent. So what's the future holder fat house? Because I've seen, I think you own a 2020 Shelby GT 500, if I'm not mistaken, or someone owns it, yeah. the shop owns it. Um, yeah. is, are you guys emerging because 350, um, you know, 2020 was the last year, I believe for GT 350s. Uh, I, I saw the video that you outlined how the engines were different and stuff like that. It was super informative. So what's the future hold in terms of the Mustang game? Because, you know, you hear EVs, you hear the ice is going away, you hear all these things uh, for the future of your company. Is is GT500 going to start becoming, you know, the, the, the new latest and greatest, you know, product you guys are going to put out there? And then what do you see? beyond that, if anything, uh, as to what your company is going to merge into, uh, depending on what happens with ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's kind of up in the air on that. I mean, that as a, as an industry, as a whole, like nobody really knows what's going to happen in five, 10 years. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly still building a lot of GT350s. That's not going anywhere for right now. There's plenty of those cars out there that are ready to be built. Um, we're definitely working on the GT500s. Um, we've already got a twin turbo car running. Uh, the red car that you're probably talking about is is my car. Um, we're doing a thousand R supercharged bolt on package uh, with Motec. Uh, we started on that today, actually, um, nice. and then it'll get turbos as well. Um, you know, we're working on that kind of stuff. Um, on top of the supercharger, like turbos. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no not doing a compound setup. The compound setups are kind of a. a a neat thing to do, I guess, but not, not for us. That's not something we're going to do. Uh, we actually designed a really nice uh, intake manifold that replaces the supercharger that has the air to water into intercooler built into it. Um, oh. And it fits under the factory strut bar. Uh, actually, we tried to model it to where it's similar shape and uh, size and everything looks similar to the supercharger, um, except it'll have turbos mounted in our, our low mount situation down at the bottom. Um, you know, obviously Motec on it. Uh, all that good stuff. So it'll be, those will be fun. Uh, Corbin's personal car, we've had it running for a while now. It makes, I think, 1180 or something like that to the wheels. Um, like one, we did like 190 and a half mile with it. Um, we're going to put bigger turbos and build motor and stuff in that car, push it a little harder too. Excellent. So let's talk about Jam Maker because I heard or saw that it recently sold. Um, it was that a bittersweet moment for you because it was the OG. Like legitimately the OG Fat House, that car was Fat House, uh, Fab, Fat House Performance. Um, tell me about like, I hate to say the journey because it sounds super gay, but you know, that car, <laughs> uh, the, when I saw it run, I literally would, uh, uh, got the Flow Racing subscription to watch Stick Shift, to watch cars like yours get down. Um, awesome. Tell me, tell, you yeah, know, it, it, for people in the Stick Shift racing world, especially S197, that, that was a badass motherfucker. Um, tell me about like what you felt like uh, selling the car, what that car meant to the company. Um, you know, how someone like Jeremy can just get everything out of it, how the experience at World Cup was. Just kind of give me a whole uh, rundown as to, you know, what that car means to you and how it felt selling it uh, finally. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Jam Maker has been through numerous different iterations, supercharged, uh, single turbo setup. Uh, the twin turbo setup, which is probably most people have seen, uh, you know, with the titanium all over the engine bay and all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, J Jeremy's built all that himself. Um, you know, I've uh, helped with some of it early on. You mentioned earlier, like asked what my role in the company was. Like, I don't spin riches anymore. I don't weld anymore. I did all that poorly, <laughs> you know, just trying to stonewall around and help the guys out uh, while, you know, trying to run the office stuff at the same time. Uh, eventually they kicked me out of the shop and it's probably better for it. Um, but the jam maker has been, has been awesome. I mean, I love that car when it was a single turbo setup, a uh, single turbo stock motor made like eight fifteen. Uh, Jeremy and I used to drive that thing around all the time. We just do second, third gear hits everywhere we went, uh, had a blast with it. Uh, you know, we drove it down. We finally ran eights in that car. We chased that for a long, long time. Uh, we finally ran eights with that car in Brainton. That was probably you had a bounty out, didn't you? Didn't you have a bounty out? Like the first eight second SO 97 yeah. would get something. 
Awesome. Yeah. What yeah, was we, it? Yeah. Uh, we, we got like $1,200 raised from a couple different sponsors um, to try just trying to make it exciting and fun for people. Um, but then we ended up winning it. So we just didn't cash in on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, really? Yeah. We did have that bounty out there for a while. Uh, you know, the uh, Jane maker, whenever we did the, like the, I guess it'd be like, like V3 when we did the twin turbo setup on it, that was a kind of a, Hey, Jeremy, do, do something crazy and cool on it. He, he came to me with this idea of doing both turbos on one side, air to water intercooler on the other side. And he was like going on and on about like how he wanted to do this. And I was like, I don't know, man, like that sounds kind of weird. I don't know. I don't know. And he's like, you just got to trust me, man. You just got to trust me. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Everything you do is badass. Just do cool stuff. And, and, I'll throw some money at it. We'll get some parts, make some cool stuff happen. Then he did it, and I was just amazed. You know, I thought it was like the coolest service setup I've ever seen. Seriously, uh, seriously. Like, yeah. you know, you ever see how everyone goes by the same template? You know, everyone goes like, yeah. they mount them here, they mount them in the middle, they mount them at then this this fucking guy mounts them on the side. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck's he doing? But it worked. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, caught, it caught everyone's eye. Yeah. And that, that's, that's definitely, Jeremy is like 100% like wants to do something different than what everybody else does. Like, he'll, you know, he's the guy that will, you know, walk around seven different obstacles to get to the same place because he wants to take a different journey. You know, he's just that he's just that guy. And he he has a really creative mind and he just has to he has to keep it, uh, you know, ignited or whatever and just keep it uh, interested. So he has to do something different all the time. You know, he does a lot of cool little fabrication projects in the shop just to keep his mind going. And it, the stuff he does is amazing. It's just it's just amazing. Um, and because, because he's your friend, I'm not trying to like dig on him or anything, but he's, is he very left brain, meaning artistic minded first, like the type of guy that can absolutely make a beautiful turbo kit like that, but can't tie his shoes, you know, like is disheveled half of the time, but he's like a genius <laughs> when it comes to like building shit. Cause I've seen people that are just artistic and just awesome, but they can't do the simple tasks of like just tying their shoes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's not him at all. No, he's, he's, I'm pretty sure he's got like double knots, nice and clean, you know, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like someone that's that, um, detail oriented and that creative, um, usually is deficient. <laughs> yeah. Something else. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think now if there's anything he's like really bad at, but I think he's just good at everything. <laughs> and you met him in the DSM world. Basically you met him back in the DSM days and everything. Yeah. So we like to joke. He picked me up at a gas station, uh, that everybody's <laughs> hanging out at. <laughs> <laughs> so i had a he, he says that he uh he gave this speech at my wedding it was great i wish i had i wish i could share it with you but he uh he came over i had a, a second generation eclipse uh that i had bought not that long ago and he came over to make fun of my alteza taillights ah, <laughs> you, you remember those chrome. yeah the riser yeah. yeah yeah i had some of those on the car and uh he came over to make fun of those and then it was just from then on out we've been best friends so it was fun and how about the other gentleman, the ZZ Top? Like, what? Yeah, how his, how'd you guys meet him? How'd you guys come across him? So Jeremy went to school with John. Uh, they were in high school together. Uh, Jeremy had, I forget, like a Nova or something like that in high school. He thought he was a badass. Uh, Johnny had a Turbo Dodge Omni and drug his shit. Oh, my God. Not yeah. a Shelby one. Was it a Shelby one? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. He had a Shelby GLHS. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Goes like hell, G L A. Oh, yeah, G -A -G -A. yeah. Like, yeah G -A. Yep. So uh, as soon as Jeremy found out about that car after he raced or whatever, he was like, oh, "I got to check this thing out." You know, so they, they've been friends forever, and before I even knew Jeremy. So then, uh, and John worked for Ganassi Racing. He was, uh, and he's also been through the Ford program as a uh, certified tech through them. Um, so he he kind of came on board as like the tech side of the shop. Um, I ran the business side of the shop, and then Jeremy was the fab side of the shop. Wow. Excellent. Yeah, no, it, it seems to work because um, for lack of a better word, you guys have somehow stayed because look, I work for Lund Racing. Everyone knows that. And there's always someone talking shit about Lund Racing. There's always someone talking shit about this shop, that shop, that shop. You guys have stayed pretty, I don't know, non, you haven't really had any beef with shop specifically. I'm sure people, you know, like one or two, but I haven't heard Fat House get, uh, into the shit with anybody do you is that a collective effort like if someone's online if so you guys nope don't 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 reply don't do this sweep it under the rug or is it just not that prevalent where people are out there like criticizing because the product is pretty damn good and they you, you just stay off people's radar that way yeah i mean we do we are, do our best to make everybody happy but you know just as well as i do that you can't do that um you know we don't we don't get into the weeds with talking shit online um you know anytime there's stuff popping up around line 
uh, pop it up online about uh, that involves us or any of the cars that we build or whatever. You know, if, if there's some factual stuff that needs corrected, we'll try to do that. Um, but we're not going to get in get in the weeds and start arguing with people online. Just nobody nobody wins those arguments. It's like trying to argue political shit. You know, you're you're never going to change anyone's mind. Nobody's ever going to win. I don't. It's just it turns into a big ego fest. So we try to do our best to sit back, stay out of it, let our work talk for itself, let our records talk for themselves. Um, you know, and just stay out of it, pretty much. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I've always I've always wondered how people have enough time to talk shit. <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah. Like you run a business, and and by the way, I wanted to ask because you you run multiple businesses, if I'm not mistaken. Is that something you'd like to talk about, or would you just not really want to delve into that? Because I saw you make a post one time, and there was some piece of equipment being dumped in, and in, in I'm like, what? And that that doesn't look like a car part. So it seemed like yeah. you've in, involved in multiple things. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, sure. I don't mind sharing about that. Um, you know, my father started a business uh, back in 1982. Uh, so this is our 40th year in business, uh, called Pool Guard. And we make swimming pool safety products to help prevent little kids from drowning in swimming pools. So okay. uh, all stuff made in USA, it's made right here in Indiana. Uh, you know, like I said, been around for 40 years. Uh, the past couple of years, I've, my dad's getting ready to retire. Uh, you know, I've worked here since I was 16 years old, uh, sweeping the floors, you know, working my way through the entire company, learning how to do every job uh, kind of thing. You know, and he's, my, my whole family's entrepreneurial. My grandpa had a clothing store uh, chain that he had for a while. Um, you know, my dad started this company and then, you know, I worked for my dad for, I don't know, probably 15, 16 years before I separated off on my way to, um, you know, do something on my own with the house. So, you know, and I, and I stayed in touch and kind of helped along the way a little bit here and there. And then now kind of back in the fold, um, you know, bringing some new technology back into that company with, which you saw that was a, uh, surface mount, uh, circuit board line. So that, that, that whole, that whole line <laughs> filled circuit boards. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how does this go into a Mustang? I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it was really interesting yeah. to look at that. But that's cool. So you have a lot going on, uh, for, for lack of a better word. So not only are you busy with Fat House, like, okay, uh, collectively, like, uh, let's say, do you spend 70% of your time Fat House and then 30% in the pool, 50 50, 60 40? What would be the split? Yeah, 70 30 is pretty good. I, I, I usually spend two days a week at the uh, pool guard business and three days a week at Fat House. And then, uh, you know, Fat House kind of never shuts off. You know how this business is like, you know, Facebook messenger people in the middle of the night, you're answering emails, you're thinking about stuff. Like I honestly it never can shut my brain off. Like I'm always thinking about, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and remember something I forgot to do and have to write it down or else I can't go back to sleep. Um, you know, there's this constantly thinking about it. Yeah. It's one of those things where you can't shut your brain off. And then, you know, you're, yep. you're like, you're, you know, you probably got to take a drink and be like, I need to relax because you know, there's 15 things you have to do, but you don't have enough. It's almost like you wish you could duplicate yourself and then you can do multiple things at the same time and go, okay, I took care of everything in one day, but I understand because you know, people like Jake and all those people, they, they need more of themselves. And I understand how difficult it is to juggle all and a family life and egos and people getting mad at stuff. And you're just like, Jesus, can you just take care of the shit? Like, yeah. do you manage, do you manage the shop or do you mostly stay in the office, take care of all the clerical stuff, take care of the QuickBooks and all that stuff? Or cause, cause if you peek your head into the shop, do they say, yeah, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, you're going to start <laughs> picking shit. Everything's running fine. Yeah. Leave it alone. Yeah. What is a little opinion? bit of both. Like, so John, Johnny runs the shop. Um, you know, he uh, handles all the text, runs everything out there. Uh, him and I are kind of on a collaborative effort because, you know, we work together on scheduling when things need to be done, that kind of stuff. But I, I'll let him 100% handle, you know, making sure that people are on task, making sure that, uh, you know, things are getting done. Do they have questions? They go to him. You know, he handles all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I do poke my head out there because I'm, you know, just going to do that. I'm going to poke my head out there and see what's going on, talk to people, make sure they're doing well. Um, you know, and I like to, I like to talk to my guys, you know, they're, I consider them all friends. Um, you know, we try to do stuff together. We did, a um, just like a, took a day off and went and played paintball and went out to eat, uh, just for no reason. Just, you know, Hey guys, I'm working hard. Let's take the day off and, and go screw off and have a good time. Um, oh, you know, that kind of stuff. so we just try That's to right. do stuff like that to, um, you know, say thank you to our people for working hard and uh, being committed. And, um, you know, so those are things we do. That's badass. So, um, back to Jam Maker. When oh, you yeah. sold it, when yep. you sold it, because I saw that it sold. Um, tell me what you. And it sounds stupid, but look, I've sold some cars that were near and dear to my heart. So that car must have. You know, how'd you feel the moment it sold? Was it? Were you like, yes, I can. We sold it. Now I can buy something else. Or did you go, ah, fuck? <laughs> yeah, really have to it was. It. it was a little bit of both, honestly. I mean, it was. 
it was kind of bittersweet because you know i do i did get to purchase a new 21 gt500 with the with the proceeds from that car uh and do something new um but it, we had a lot of good good times in that car a lot of good racing a lot of good promotion um i try to just look at it as uh you know we we had that car it served its purpose we did some really cool stuff luckily we were in an age where we can document a lot of that so i can always go back and you know watch that stuff if i want to see it again um you know i've got this i don't know if you can see it in my in my home office there's a a plaque on the wall oh, to yeah. remind me um you know that's from the, the article that um fastest street car did uh right after bowling green the car wasn't even running at the time but uh, we just got it together uh we took it down anyway just because it set it in the booth and you know show off a little bit um but i've always got that to remind me and then you know the videos and the pictures and all that good stuff and then you know allows us to go into the next chapter of something else cool What's the best memory you had in that vehicle? Like, uh, was it was it running the numbers at World Cup? Was it uh, like what is the best memory you have in that vehicle? So, the numbers at World Cup was was super badass, but I'd say that's probably Jeremy's best memory because he was the one that was driving. Uh, for now, me, it was running. Best memory. Right. <laughs> yeah, my best memory was certainly when we were down in Bradenton, uh, 2018, maybe I forget what year it was now, but when we broke into eights for the first time, that was a. Uh, you know, we we had like a really nice bottle of bourbon in the in the trailer, and we were ready to crack it. Had a couple of races before that, and not not able to do it, and then got to Bradenton, broke a drive shaft. Uh, Justin Jordan hooked us up with another one. We drove to his shop, grabbed the drive shaft, put it in the car. Uh, the guys at SCT let us run another pass after the race was over to try to get it, and we were lucky enough to to grab the second pass after that. So everybody was jumping up and down, screaming, you know, just having a good time. So we we had a lot of fun. Very good. So on GT500, because you said there's a lot of GT350 stuff. Is there any, GT500 is probably the future short term in terms of, okay, this is what people want the latest and greatest now. But on GT350, since you have vetted combos, 800, what are your combos before I misspeak? What are the combos that you uh, have for the GT350, uh, you know, Mustangs? So for the 350s, we have, uh, we have just like a basic bolt on 600R, which is, you know, headers, intake, flex fuel uh makes like 535 or so of the wheels um then we have a uh, 800r supercharge package we have an 800r twin turbo package and then goes 1000r 1200r 1400r and 1600r all twin turbo packages what is your most popular uh setup that 800 and 1000 are real close together uh, we have a lot of people that don't have access to e85 and just want to do a pump gas setup so uh, 800r is what they go with and then thousand r if they have uh, availability for e85 the thousand r is probably the most popular how many 1600 r packages have you sold <laughs> i mean like so, 1600 <laughs> yeah it's not it's not a popular package you don't have a lot of people that want to you know throw their dick out like that um, yeah, yeah but, they chop the nuts on everybody but you know why yeah <laughs> yeah um you know we've got a couple of good customers that have done 1600 r builds but we've only got a few of them so um you know it's not it's not a, a big a big seller it's we're honestly we're really fortunate to have customers that have the means and are cool enough to let us build those cars uh you know we feel super fortunate that there's people out there that want to do that and you know allow us to kind of experiment with their cars and push the envelope and guys that that just want to say i have the fastest you know gt350 and a half mile or in the quarter mile and they, and they want to do whatever it takes to get there um you know the, the whole industry benefits from that kind of stuff yeah, because once you do it, people are going to be like, well, Jesus, I, you know, can we do it? And, and then you get competition, which is always good for for development. And, you you know, if it's just you guys, king of the hill, and no one else is pushing you guys, you guys will just become stagnant. Um, are there any products that you see coming up in the future for your GT350 stuff that maybe you'd like, you know, keep close to the vest? But do you see any new products in terms of whether it be catch cans, whether it be just different things? Or are you pretty much well settled on what you got going on and then working on GT500 and, and forward? Yeah, we're definitely still developing a lot of, um, you know, like accessory parts for the GT350 stuff. Um, we've got a new catch can coming out uh, that'll work for any S550. Uh, it's, we're going to call it the S550 Extreme Race Catch Can, uh, which is going to be larger than our current one to be taller. And it has a flat panel filter on top instead of uh, the two round breather filters like our standard one does. And then it also has uh, two 12-AN vents and two 10-AN vents. So you can have four uh, vents from the valve covers um, in case you're, you know, it's really for like guys making 1,500 plus horsepower uh, that need that extra vent from the valve cover. So uh, we have that product coming out. Um, we've got a lot of little products that we haven't released yet that we use in our builds. Uh, we have a, a really cool, um, like the head cooling mod, you know, they have the, the billet piece mm -hmm. that goes in the back. And we have one of yep. those that has a, a coolant uh, bypass valve 
in it that uh, uh, it's like a pop off valve. So I'd like, I think it's like 25 or 30 PSI. It'll pop off and let the coolant pressure bleed off into a catch can. So if you're okay. going down the track under, you know, 45 pounds of boost and your head gaskets are starting to blow, it'll pop out into that catch can instead of blowing your head gaskets all over the place and causing you to wreck going down the track. Um, you know, stuff like that is, you know, some, some little kits that we've got that we built in house and installed on customer cars that are in the line, uh, to release to the public that we just haven't got around to yet. How difficult is that to release a new part? Because, um, you know how it is, you, you make a prototype and then you have to like put it in production. Um, let's say for instance, on your new catch can, if say Jeremy's like, ah, I couldn't sleep last night. I made a whole new catch can and it has to go out right now. Uh, from beginning to, from prototyping to actually putting it out, uh, as a finished piece, uh, what's the process like in other words like you have to obviously vet the product make a jig to make it repeatable um you know like can it take months for a product to come to market after initial development oh yeah for sure yeah i mean to do it right i think it's three to six months at least three to six months yeah okay so that so when <laughs> so what when you see not and i'm, I'm not t I'll, i'm doing the shit talking here so when i see a product come out quickly in response to another product. That's when I kind of get a little suspect. I'm not trying to name names here, but I've seen a lot of people make, um, I don't want to say copies, but they definitely say, okay, um, we just came out with this. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just saw it last week <laughs> and now it's already in production. And I'm just like, how the hell does that happen? So do you ever look at stuff like that and you just kind of not necessarily snicker, but you just kind of go, yeah, what are you doing? Like, what, what the hell? Cause I kn you know what the process is like to bring something like that to market. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens all the time. You get a lot of small shops or small fabricator guys that, you know, can build stuff. And, and we did it a lot when we were young. Um, you know, when we're just getting started, you, know, you build stuff quickly, you build one by hand, and you throw it in the, out there in the world as quick as possible to try to get some sales. Um, you know, and that, that's just the way it works. Like, that's that's how small guys make their money, and that's how they get stuff out there. Um, you know, and, and as you grow as a company, you learn that you just can't do that. Um, you've got to... You know, like you said, you've got to vet the product, you got to you got to build it, you've got to build jigs, you've got to make sure it's repeatable, you've got to make sure that you have availability for parts uh, so you can meet the supply, you got to have stuff ready to go when you release it. Guys don't want to call up and find out, oh, it's going to be six weeks before I can get that, um, you know, because it's got to go to coding, it's got to get this done, whatever. Um, you know, that stuff's all going to be done. So you, you learn as you, as you grow and you get older that you just have to spend the time, you know, build the product out properly, have it ready to go. Um, you know, if, if it needs instructions, you have to do instructions. You have to have all that kind of stuff set up, you know, photos, marketing material, all that. How has the uh, supply chain stuff affected you guys when it comes to product, when it comes to just raw materials? What, what has been the biggest challenge in the latest uh, silliness when it comes to supply chain issues? We honestly didn't have much trouble until more recently. Um, you know, we early on in COVID, like through most of 2020, nothing was an issue. We were able to get parts, get stuff that we needed. Um, you know, probably mid-year last year, stuff started becoming more of a problem. Um, you know, we don't do a huge volume of builds. We don't sell, you know, we don't sell 50 sets of headers a month or whatever off our website. So we don't have to worry about being able to get that kind of stuff in. But if we have a build coming up that needs a set of, you know, stainless works headers or whatever, like that stuff started taking a long time to get in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were getting tires are becoming a problem. Um, you know, we're having problems with electronic stuff. A lot of the microchip uh, stuff has started to filter down into the smaller industries from the bigger manufacturers. So that's become part of a problem for us. Um, you know, and, and I'm not sure if it's going to continue to get worse or if it's going to start getting better. Do you have to then kind of like uh, prepare for that, like uh, make contingency plans, uh, even, even though you can't stock up on stuff that's not available? Um, do you start actually having to proactively look for replacements for things that you used to kind of use all the time. And you, now you got to look at, okay, what's the, you know, what, what would be the, the product that would do the same as this? Because if you're going to need to wait for like, even someone like a Motec had issues just receiving, you know, certain parts. And in the last, what, two or three months, they started, you know, shipping stuff again that, that was backordered for a bit. Like you mentioned tires, like, do you have to do some proactive stuff to get, no, no redundancy in terms of parts or is that pretty difficult because the build that you have you prefer a certain part to to give it the you know fat house stamp of approval yeah we definitely i mean we, we've, we've got parts that we want to use in these builds so there's very few parts that we can substitute with something else um where we can we will but mo in most cases we've had to uh order the parts that we needed and then sometimes put in order for stuff that we don't even need yet just to try to get it in the chain 
uh, get it, you know, get it in the pipeline of it's getting built or get, it's on order. Um, you know, luckily enough, the doing everything as a package and as a standard, we know what parts we're going to need. And we can forecast that based off of what we sold last year, you know, to try to guess what we're going to need, get that stuff on order so that it's coming in. And then as we sell stuff, we're able to, you know, pull from our inventory and, and use that. And we build a lot of the stuff ourselves too. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the twin turbo packages, um, there's probably 75, 80% is all built in house. So let, let me, you know, take a bit of a left turn here to transmissions. Um, favorite transmission that ever came into, oh, not ever came into Mustang. Let's just say you, you've, you've driven Fox bodies back in the day. You've driven what, three valves, you've driven two valves. I'm sure you've driven a Cobra here and there out of the, out of all the Mustangs, uh, that you've ever driven, which transmission felt the best to you? Um, overall, I really like the 3160. Um, other than, really? other than <laughs> I do, other than it doesn't hold the power. Um, you know, third gear is weak as shit and just explodes in any, about any situation. Uh, oh, that's the GT350 uh, transmission? Yeah, it's the GT350 and it's also in the Mach 1. Um, the, I think the transmission, the gearing is great in it. Um, it shifts nice uh, with a good clutch and a good shifter. It drives just, it drives great. Um, mm -hmm. It just won't hold the power. Uh, but it, the problem, with, like we put a T56 in these cars. Uh, T56 holds plenty of power. The gearing is great for big power cars. Um, but you just, you, you feel vibrations and it's just not as refined as like the, the factory setup is in the 350. Um, you know, so my vote would have to go for the, the 3160. Yeah. In stock form, it doesn't get much better than a 350. I tell people all the time, um, it's a great car to leave alone because usually what you're going to use it for is going to, the car, you can't outdrive that car. Most people don't have the ability to outdrive that right. car. Oh yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. And they, and they think they can. And I'm like, ah. I really don't think you can. Um, T56s, have you noticed, <laughs> I've noticed, but I don't know if you have noticed, that they're just inherently hot? Like when you're driving the car, <laughs> do you feel heat coming up from the shift around those things? Well, you do, but if you you can you can insulate it pretty well. Um, you know, we put quite a bit of uh, insulation around the, around the shifter and in the transmission tunnel. Um, you know, we, we run uh, cooler setups on all of them. Um, you know, we don't run any of them without a cooler setup. Uh, we've actually got, we've done quite a few of them now. We've got a, a pretty extensive uh, GT350 T56 swap kit that includes everything to adapt it into the uh, the factory trans cooler setup, all the lines, fittings. Um, we do a T56 with an internal mechanical pump. Um, so that that helps the tranny live longer, helps keep it cooler. Um, you know, that, that definitely helps with that. And then it has everything completely plug and play uh, to make it work on a 350. I've noticed you guys use a distinctive clutch in your kits, especially on the thousand horsepower and up. But what is the clutch that that seems to be the go-to that you guys have? I don't know if it's RPS or something like that, some similar. Yep. Uh, what is it? Yeah, so so we we fought clutch issues for a long time with these builds. Um, you know, nobody was doing what we were doing, especially in the 350 with the vibrations and everything you deal with in the flat plane crank. Uh, you know, we went through a couple of different clutch manufacturers trying to find something that would work. We'd find something that would hold the power, then it wouldn't shift wouldn't release we you know dealing with you know spacing of the uh throw out bearing to get that correct we we dealt with uh you know we rebuilt so many clutches my guys know more about clutch setup than they care to know about <laughs> let's put it that way uh right. but we finally landed on, on uh rps the the carbon setups that they have um and we actually had to basically redesign uh their clutch setups a couple of times to get it perfected um and through doing that we actually have a exclusive deal with rps now so we sell all of their uh gt350 clutches they they sell all through us um you know that we put in quite a bit of time and effort to make it perfect uh you know so then we have the ability to, to sell those so and we keep them in stock I, I usually have at least one or two in stock uh on the shelf and constantly have new ones coming in but it is legitimately the best shifting driving power holding clutch we've ever had uh, you know, we beat the shit out of them and they they don't care they love it just keep keep hammering down and they shift great so not that's much more. Where, that's where I noticed because I, no one else is talking about that. Like, when have you ever talked about anyone? I mean, you show the clutch, but then people go, "Why that clutch?" Like, I, I haven't really seen anyone go, "Why that clutch?" And then you said you've worked with them to redesign it based on what you your needs are. What was the first? Um, not to talk, talk negatively about them, but what was the first thing you saw that needed attention on their clutch setup in your application? So, so we had some issues with them with uh, holding power, uh, had issues with it, the other clutch not releasing as well. Um, we, we had found out through uh, checking and looking over that the 26 spline 
of the 3160 is different than the 26 block line of the uh, T56 Magnum. They're the same okay. size, but the, the actual pitch of the splines is mm -hmm. different. We had to use a, uh, I forget the exact name of the, of the tool, some, some type of like microscopic measuring tool to go in there and look at the pitch uh, of those splines. And come to find out, it was quite a bit different uh, than the T56 Magnum, which was an assumption based on, you know, just assuming that Tremec would use the same spline. It's the same amount of splines. It's just right. They just change the angle and didn't tell anybody. You, know, you can't. Nobody. T nobody shares information uh, in this industry at all. Like you have to learn everything on your own. We learned that along the way. Uh, so we finally figured that out and got the splines corrected, and that fixed a ton of problems. The you know the disc. You have three discs riding on a spline. I don't care how how much you lap them in, how much you uh, make sure they they sit on there right. Like if they're if that angle is wrong you know, they're going to, they're going to drag and then they're not, it's not going to release and it's not going to hold the power either because they can't clay the full clamp load on it because it's binding up. It's not letting the plates, uh, you know, grip it, grip it next to each other enough. The first thing I saw when, um, the video of Jeremy <clears throat> at the half mile event, when <laughs> he launches the car, like he <laughs> foot to floor, foot to floor, let's go the clutch. And I'm like, yeah. either it's the traction control or it's the long gearing. I, I like it's the gearing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it blew my mind seeing that. Yeah. And then it shifted the one two at like 80 something hundred. And I went, what clutch is in mm -hmm. that freaking thing? So when I saw that, I said, mental note, ask him about that. Because yeah. people, did anyone else notice that? Like, did anyone else say, hey, in that video, he just mashed it to the floor? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, everybody's like, what? The car bogged. What happened? You know, like someone, they, they all thought that Jeremy did something wrong there. And it's that car has a ton of gear in it in first gear and it's a quad carbon clutch. Uh, so it's Oof. super grabby. There's like no slipping that thing at all. Um, you know, and those two things combined, like it just wouldn't go. So that's just the way it is. Like we're, we're playing to drag race that car. So we're going to see uh, what we have to do to get it to actually come out of the hole. Um, you know, it's got some, some new things coming out on it. It's gonna make a little bit more power when it comes back out. Um, some, some new cool stuff and have our air to water intake manifold on it as well. So what are your goals um, to wrap up here? What are your goals for 2022? Like you have, um, obviously the GT500 is going to become a, a thing that you guys are going to be working on and we'll hopefully see something like that out there, but you're going to go to more events. You mentioned the GT350 becoming a drag car. Do you have any goals set for 2022 that we should look out for? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see that 1600R uh, with a sequential run seven. Um, I think it'll be really close to it. Uh, we'll see what that does. Uh, we want to we want to go like two ten plus in the half mile in that car. Um, that so Jeremy has a Jeremy has a new project. He has a Fox body that he's building now, single turbo I Coyote. That. I yeah, that. actually, it's gonna have a it's gonna have a Voodoo in it. We're putting a Voodoo in that. Um, so just Motec, for fun, Motec also. Motec Voodoo single turbo. It's like a eighty eight, I think, single eighty eight. You know, and, it, and it's like 700 pounds lighter than the Jam Maker was. So, and it's got a lot nicer parts in it. We're doing a lot of be a lot better stuff in that car. Uh, he's going to do Drag Week with it. He wants to compete in Drag Week, so that'll be cool. Uh, obviously, run sevens in that. We think it'll probably do seven thirties, maybe something Stop like that. It. Yeah. Get it, well, yes. well, at MIR, maybe at MIR. <laughs> I was going to say, so because you guys got a lot of data from the Black Magic Clutch setup on the Jam Maker, yeah. are you guys using a similar setup on this car? Yeah, it's going to be the same, same trans, same clutch, uh, same ECU, you know, same basic engine setups, just a single turbo and a better chassis. Um, so I think we'll be able to trans transpose all that into uh, Jeremy's build. I couldn't imagine the Jam Maker three or four hundred pounds lighter, like that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and well, we we talked it, about that at at uh, at World Cup. We were talking about that because that car went seven fifty seven at I think thirty six hundred pounds something like that Man. so if that if that car if that car would have been right around three thousand pounds we put a little bit more power to it it'd be kind of kind of cool to see what it do with power it's a power windows power windows all glass you know and, and we literally drive that car to and from the lanes like it was you know you could cruise that car you could take it on a drag week style cruise if you wanted to all right that's what i noticed about that car like it wouldn't get pushed to the lanes it would just show up run a number drive back you know i know you got to have some 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 sensor issues and this and this and that but when that thing made a lick it was like holy shit, that thing gets down so you can't really and then now he's building a fox body in this similar fashion of that car it's going to be interesting to see you guys are going to hit up uh world cup you're going to hope to hit up world cup and then yeah, maybe we'll do a drag week. yeah world cup uh drag week i know we're going to do some shows too like uh pony we're going to try to do ponies in the smokies um, some of some events just to kind of you know bring some cars out and hang out. 
Um, we're going to do uh, what other events are we talking about doing? We just talked about these the other day. Um, we'll probably do a couple of streetcar takeovers. Uh, if we can find any stick shift events, we'll probably try to hit those up. We'll do mod nats. We're we'll ready mod nats again this year. Um, sure. probably, probably do it with some different cars. I don't know if Jeremy's car will try to do mod nats and uh, World Cup. That's a, those are two tough back to back. So close together. Yeah, they're I so know. close together. It's like that's just a beating the shit out of the cars. But no, man, I really wanted to uh, get you on here. You're the first guy I've interviewed in this platform, and I wanted to just kind of just introduce you to my audience. But more than anything, I, I felt you deserved a kind of more recognition. Not that you'd lack it, but um, I, I think it's important that people kind of get to know your your process and get to know the man behind and the people behind uh, the Fat House Fab, Fat House Performance, the whole nine yards. Uh, where are you guys located? Just to make sure that give you guys a little plug, where are you guys located? Where can people yes. get a hold? Yeah, sure. So there, we're, we're in Indianapolis, Indiana, just south of the city. Um, you know, check us out on our website, Fat House Fab or FatHousePerformance.com. Uh, keep up on our, you know, Instagram probably is the most prevalent where all the cool pictures are shared, that kind of stuff. And then YouTube channel uh, is Fat House Fab as well. Very good. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much for doing this for me. I know you didn't have to, and I know you're a busy man. I know you have many things in the pot, so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out to talk to me. Real quick. Yeah, always, Alex. Always good to talk to you, man. Appreciate it. I appreciate, I appreciate you, brother. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Bye.